Hello guys, Winston here. People who follow me on Instagram probably know that I've been sucked into the autonomous spaceport drone ship coaster Pit of Despair. In my attempts to make ASDS coasters available for other people, I've run into numerous problems that have set back my production schedule. The differences between making one-off prototypes and mass-producing parts can be substantial, and if you're not prepared for it, you can be in for a world of hurt. But let's not focus on the setbacks just yet. Let's start with my process to go from single set prototyping to batching out a dozen coasters at a time. In order to make these coasters in any sort of quantity, I realized early on that I'd need to cut out as many as I could in a single operation. I valued my time, so the longer I could let my CNC run autonomously between tool changes and loading material, the happier I would be. Because this would also mean that I'd be running my CNC continuously, I moved my stock shape OCO3 into the garage as a courtesy to my roommates. I sketched out different arrangements of boards to try and figure out just how many coasters I could cut at a time. Each coaster would take up 3.25 inches of board length, and wood is sold in lengths of 2, 4, or 8 feet. Board segments loaded into the CNC would need to be of equal length, so it wouldn't do me much good to cut boards to exactly fit 3 or 4 coasters. Cutting anything other than 12 or 16 inch increments would leave me with awkwardly sized offcuts. The Shape Oco 3 has an advertised workspace of 16 by 16 inches. In reality, it's closer to 16 and a half inches in each dimension, but a non-trivial amount of that area extends over the front lip of the machine. Most people therefore end up cutting within a 16 by 14 inch space. If I were cutting 12 inch boards, this wouldn't be a problem, but that would limit me to cutting out 9 coasters at a time. If I could load just a couple more inches of stock, I'd be able to cut 12 coasters at a time, or 3 full sets. But accommodating a trio of 16 inch boards would mean that I'd be using all of the Shape Oco 3's workspace. Plus, I'd need even more room for work holding purposes, and that just wasn't going to happen on my threaded table. So I made a fixed ring jig out of 2 sheets of MDF. It has a 16 by 165 inch pocket cut into the top layer to easily position my boards, and wings that extend in the Y direction with threaded holes I could use to clamp my boards down. Now I was ready to cut. One of the first things I discovered was that nominal dimensions of wood mean nothing. Straight out of the store, board thicknesses can vary by over a sixteenth of an inch. This may not sound like much, but when you're doing detail work with a 132nd inch end mill, a drastic change in the depth of cut can ruin your end mill. I didn't realize this at first, and broke a pair of end mills quite stupidly. You don't realize these things when you make one-off prototypes, because you only have to account for the z-axis zero of one board at a time. So I decided to try and manufacture more consistent 5 16 inch pine boards by resawing a 1x6 and sanding or planing them down to the desired thickness. This didn't go quite as smoothly as I'd hoped because any twist in the boards caused slight variations in the thickness coming off the bandsaw. Furthermore, I could only get my board faces parallel but not straight because I didn't have access to a jointer. In the end, I ended up with a bunch of boards between 0.29 and 0.33 inches thick. This wasn't the end of the world though because I had enough boards that I could group them by thickness. Now I could cut three boards at a time without a wild variation in the depth of cut. My next challenge was to address the inherent bow in my boards. Since I was clamping my stock at both ends, concave up boards could be made to lay flat on my table. The same could not be said for concave down boards. Coasters cut from the middle of these boards would have deeper features assuming they didn't break my end mill first, so I had to take extra time to counteract any detrimental distortion of my boards. This basically entailed clamping them up for 48 hours before cutting. Once I was cutting out coasters with yields of 90% or better, my next focus was to try and optimize my G-code. Maximizing feed rate was an obvious possibility, but I couldn't do too much there. My engraving end mill was pretty fragile, and I could still encounter 10 or 20 thou of variation between boards. Cutting conservatively was my insurance policy against breaking bits. Instead, I tried to do more with my 2mm end mill, which was more robust and could remove more material per pass. Since it had no corners, the outer ring on the ASTS insignia was one such area where I could employ a larger end mill. The outer profile of the ASDS was another place where the 2mm end mill could speed things up, but there were a couple corners present so I'd have to precede this external pocketing operation with a contour cut by my 132nd inch end mill. Doing all of these things, I cut my cycle time by about 20%. One thing I was doing was cutting corners by assuming that there were no tool length offset differences between end mills if I backed the locating collar against my collet nut. I wasn't re-zeroing my z-axis between tool changes. But in reality, the distance from that collar to the tip of the end mill has a tolerance of a couple thou. For my outer profile, since I was combining a 132nd inch contour with a 2mm pocketing operation, I was actually left with a small ledge on the floor of my pocket. The 132nd inch end mill had cut just a tiny bit deeper than the 2mm end mill. 
My workaround was to set the bottom of my contour cut a fraction of a millimeter above the floor of the operation, and let the 2mm end mill reach the full depth. The only places where this wouldn't hold up were in the corners, and I highly doubted anyone would notice these tiny bits of leftover material. After all these tweaks, my workflow was finally robust against variations in board thickness and end mill length, and I could focus on finishing. I would first clean up my coasters with 220 grit sandpaper and a file. This was the most time consuming part for me, and I quickly noticed a pattern. Some of the internal features were fuzzier than I expected, despite using a down cutting end mill. Getting into all the nooks and crannies with sandpaper was really tedious, so I opened up Fusion 360 one more time to add a finishing pass to these features. This resulted in much cleaner coasters coming off my Shape Oko. Just before applying coats of spray polyurethane, I marked my coasters with the branding iron I'd made in my last video. Finally, after weeks of non-stop problem solving, I was running a smooth production line. The journey to get here was frustrating at times, but it was a challenge I didn't regret undertaking. This project was an incredibly educational experience that forced me to consider additional factors I'd overlooked in the first pass of my design. I now have a lot more respect for people who do things like pull off successful Kickstarter campaigns. For those of you watching this video on release day, I have a very limited number of coaster sets left on my Etsy store. After they run out, I can't guarantee I'll restock my store since I want to move on to new projects. If you made it this far, I want to thank you very much for watching. That's all I have for the ASTS coaster project, and you are free to click away now. I just wanted to make a 30 second addendum to answer a question from the comment section of my last video, asking what my thought process was with setting up an Etsy store and where I wanted to take it. In a nutshell, I really enjoy making things. It's a therapeutic, creative endeavor for me, and I'd love to do it full-time, but that's a financial impossibility right now. Bob Claggett from I Like To Make Stuff gave me some advice to pursue multiple avenues of income. You never know which ones will stick, but you won't know until you try. So right now, I'm just playing around. I'm learning how to run a business, how to problem-solve through frustration, and finding out what I'm good at. For example, I'm not that great at making straight-up tutorials. I have more fun explaining my projects as a narrative. So far that seems to be working out. In the future, I may want to change things up. Thinking long term, if one day it looks like I could support myself with YouTube or have an income stream made possible by my notoriety in the CNC community, I'd take that opportunity in a heartbeat. But for now, I'm just putting myself out there to learn as much as I can. Hopefully that gives you an idea as to what I'm trying to accomplish on YouTube, and I'll see you in a couple weeks with a new CNC project that will thankfully have nothing to do with drone ship coasters.